Hello, my friends. This is Linda Lippin, and welcome to the Pilates Goddess Podcast. Well, hello, and welcome back one more time to the Pilates Goddess Podcast. This is your host, Linda Lippin, coming to you from my lovely apartment in Lower Manhattan. I hope everybody is doing well today. And today's subject is one very near and dear to my heart, which is words matter. Let's talk about the language of Pilates and how the language of Pilates is specific in many ways to Pilates and how using the wrong language in the Pilates studio can actually make teaching harder and it can make it harder for you as a client to understand what it is that you want to do. Now, you guys know that I used to be a philosophy professor and I've also been teaching Pilates for 34 years. And there is a certain language and a certain patter that you generally will hear in Pilates studios. There's also specific exercise names. And exercise names, especially in Pilates, are important. And they are important because... Nowadays, with the proliferation of franchise club Pilates studios and big box gyms doing Pilates classes, especially apparatus classes, you have clients who travel and clients who may even come into your studio who normally might go to a club Pilates or a different studio and are suddenly coming in to visit you because maybe like at Real Pilates, we had a hotel right across the street from the studio, right? So people would come over to Real to take classes, you know, being sent over by the concierge and basically came because of the convenient location. They uh, didn't always come from classical Pilates studios, but pretty much everybody we saw and spoke to loved the work that they did with us at Real. And one of the things that a few clients mentioned to me that they really enjoyed about their time um, in Tribeca was the consistency that no matter what teachers they had, whether they were doing reformer or tower class or, you know, a mat class, that They were hearing the same exercise names and the same language about how to move coming from all of the teachers. Now, newer Pilates teachers and more contemporary trained Pilates teachers tend to really worry about people and clients getting bored. And so you tend to be less consistent in the language that you use when you're worried that your clients are going to get bored. You start calling exercises by different names. You start calling movements out in different ways. And clients can get very, very confused about this. Frankly, so can instructors. So I think that if we can look at maybe coming to some common ground on the language of Pilates and the names of Pilates exercises that, you know, it will make everyone's life easier. It'll make teachers' lives easier. It'll make clients' lives easier. Now, you may wonder how I'm getting to this topic today. And some of it has to do with, you know, the questions that I always, you know, see online in my Pilates teacher mastermind group and in other people's, you know, Facebook groups of Pilates instructors. Uh, Teachers also reach out to me with questions, you know, people who listen to the podcast. 
And I also have a lot of clients who work with me online, but also do performer classes and go, you know, to Pilates classes in different studios. Um, And I was talking actually to one of my clients today and she was asking me a question about doing the Superman exercise on the reformer um, because she had been given this in a reformer class. And this particular client of mine is wonderful and has been doing Pilates for decades um, and is a very educated mover. Now, if you say to me or to her that you want us in a Superman position, then we are thinking back to say the Superman exercise on the floor or on the mat. Now, what is that? It is essentially the preparatory position for swimming in Pilates, right? It's where you come up, say you're lifting up a little bit off the mat, the legs come up a little bit, the arms come up, and the body is pretty much in a straight line with a teeny bit of hyperextension. And then when we swim, we lift up the opposite arm and leg and we keep moving with that. Now that initial position is of course called Superman because that's the position that we might associate Superman, the DC comics hero with when he's flying in the air. All right. So Superman is that position of flying. But when she said that to me, I thought, I can't think of any Superman position that we go into on the reformer. Like, that's just not an exercise name on the reformer. You know, we can do, you know, swimming prep on the long box and things like that. But I knew that that wasn't what she was talking about. So the first thing I did was go online and go to YouTube. (laughs) So I go to YouTube and I look up Pilates reformer Superman. And lo and behold, I get a bunch of hits. And they're all different exercises, basically, which is, you know, kind of scary. So the first one I see is actually a teacher doing the long stretch. Now, if you are a Pilates teacher or you do Pilates, the long stretch on the reformer is with your hands on the foot bar, your feet either together on the head rest, which is up and your feet are on a sticky pad so you don't slide, or your feet can be against the shoulder blocks. You're up in a plank with straight arms and a straight spine and body, and then you're just pushing yourself back a few inches and pulling yourself forward a few inches. That's the long stretch. That is not Superman. Superman. Okay. I don't know where that name came from. I don't know why it's called the long stretch. Uh, Some folks call it long straight body, but basically you're in a plank, hands are on the bar and you're pushing yourself back and pulling yourself forward. So I was like, all right, not that. Then I come to the next exercise and it says Superman reformer. And they're basically doing knees off knee stretches, but with the carriage pushed most of the way back. So the, basically the upper arm is next to the head. Once again, it's not called Superman. It's called knees off knee stretches, and it is not really done in that extended position. And there's a reason for that. It's because it's hard to maintain that push back and maintain the integrity and strength of your powerhouse and middle body and do things with your legs. So, you know, in classical Pilates, we get very stable with that by 
at least at the beginning, really keeping the chest over the spring bar, staying up and just moving the knees and, and the legs. Once again, we're not coming into a Superman position, and I don't understand the reference to Superman in that position. And then I come to one, which I believe is the one that my client was attempting to do um, and couldn't for all of the above reasons, where they sat all the way back with feet against the shoulder blocks and hands on the bar, came into essentially the position of knees off knee stretch, lifted the knees, pushed the shoulders all the way back so that the upper arm was next to her head, and then straightened the legs. And once she was out in that straight leg position, she basically couldn't maintain it from her powerhouse and she hurt herself, but that's a whole nother story. And this is why this language that we use and what we're telling people to do is so important, right? Because if you're an educated mover and you do things other than Pilates or you're a gymnast or you're a dancer or you lift weights or or you do exercises off of YouTube, which so many people do, which is fine. You have a certain association of what the Superman shape looks like for the upper body. And if somebody asks you to do that in an inappropriate place, weight bearing on a moving carriage with springs, there's a good chance you're going to hurt yourself doing that exercise. And that concerns me, number one, because it is not a Pilates exercise, given that way. But number two, even the exercises that you might be teaching using that language are not Superman exercises. And if we would use the actual names that Joseph Pilates gave to those exercises, you know, within reason then at least we all have some common ground on what we're looking at. And then if you want to do, you know, crazy modifications and variations off of that, you know, you do you, but just know that then you're sort of going out of the system, right? How many times have I talked on this podcast? How many times about Pilates being a system (laughs) developed by a human being who? invented these apparatuses who invented, not necessarily invented these exercises, but named these exercises, named these exercise sequences, put them in a certain order so that the body could warm up and start to move in certain ways. And to say then that we're teaching his work and then not only not teach his work, okay, but not even use the appropriate language for his exercises, I think is, is doing all of us a huge, huge disservice. Now, even if you are a more contemporary trained teacher and not a classically trained teacher, there are so many places online where you can get lists of the names of the exercises, get lists of the order People, you know, there are plenty of YouTube channels, there are plenty of Facebook groups. In my Pilates Teacher Mastermind VIP program, which is for, you know, right now $37 a month or $297 a year, you get an entire look into the entire Pilates system with all the names of the exercises on all of the pieces of the apparatus with all of the modifications and variations that you could possibly want for special populations. But the only reason why I am able to do that and to offer that to teachers from all backgrounds is that we use the common language that Joseph Pilates developed for his exercises. We can talk about what those exercises might look like if you're doing them someplace else. Okay. 
Like, for example, I said that the long stretch is kind of like a plank in this position with the hands and feet in in certain places and two heavier springs on that reformer for stability. Remember that when we do Pilates, working lighter makes things a hell of a lot less stable. So if your client is not super stable and you're asking for a lot of mobility work out of the joints, you might put your client in a very dangerous place on a reformer with too little spring. And if you're a client and you start envisioning exercises and nobody's giving you a good basis of what that should look like or what that is, I hate to say this, but you should start looking at different studios and different teachers because you could get hurt in those conditions through no fault of your own. Now, as you know, I have very strong feelings about not putting paying clients into positions where they could get very hurt. I am the first one to hand off a client to a different teacher if I am not sure how to work with them. Now, that rarely happens to me anymore, but it did happen to me earlier in my career, and I was lucky enough in Philadelphia to even there to be surrounded by enough good teachers who were a little more seasoned than I was that I had folks that I could refer out to. But of course, the other thing that I did was I brought physical therapists and chiropractors and people like that into my Pilates studio so that when folks needed more help, more support, and maybe I needed more help and more support, I had everybody around me um, to give me that. And there's other language that I'm hearing that is not Pilates at all. And I'm going to talk about that. So once again, if I hear neutral spine one more time, I'm going to scream because neutral spine is not an appropriate teaching tool. Neutral spine is a meaningless phrase. I've said over and over in here, your spine moves every time you move, your spine moves every time you breathe, your spine moves when you're sleeping at night because you're breathing. Okay, so there is no, you know, non-moving spine position. Everybody's spine curve looks different. Okay. It depends on body shape. It depends on weight. It depends on posture. It depends on, you know, how you move your skeleton. There's all kinds of um, differences in how people's spines look. Men and women can actually look very different in very similar spine curves, which is interesting. And Frankly, there are folks whose spine curves due to scoliosis, due to extreme kyphosis, uh, compression Mm -hmm. fractures, spondylolisthesis, like my husband has and just pointed out, that their spine curves are kind of, excuse my language, but fucked up. And those are not spine curves. That might be their neutral, but it's not necessarily the healthiest place for their spine to be. And it's not necessarily the healthiest place for anybody's spine to be. So if you go back, I think it's my, I think my first episode is about neutral spine and how it's not a thing (laughs) and how that phrase should be sort of taken out of, of the lexicon. Things that we hear in Pilates studios, whether you are a classical teacher or a contemporary teacher we hear things like scoop the belly up and in. We might hear navel to spine. We might hear pull in and up around the corset of your abdominal muscles. We might hear open up your collarbones. As you know, if you've been listening for a while too, I'm not a huge fan of pushing the shoulders down on the rib cage for a variety of reasons. 
but I am a fan of having folks open up their collarbones and get a little bit of squeeze back into the upper shoulder blade, right? And starting to strengthen their muscles from that position. You'll hear talk about tilting the pelvis backward and flattening the lower back a little bit. You'll hear talk about tilting the pelvis and the hip bones forward and letting the lower back arch a little bit. You might hear talk about finding middle ground with the pelvis. Some folks might call it neutral pelvis. Some folks might just say get really heavy across your sacrum, the wide bone at the bottom of your spine um, and across your hip bones which kind of puts you in that same position. You might hear gaze forward, look slightly up. You might hear drop your chin a little bit towards your chest and lengthen the back of your neck. You might hear, you know, curl your upper body up to the tips of your shoulder blades. Still keep the collarbones open. Keep the sacrum heavy. You know, you might hear talk about C curves, right? In say the first round knee stretch, you're in a deep C curve. In elephant on the reformer, you're in a deep C curve. Rolling like a ball, deep C curve. (laughs) Open like rocker, deep C curve. Um, So you might hear that phrase of, of the C curve. You'll hear talk about the powerhouse. And I've talked about the powerhouse on the podcast before because the powerhouse is all of those muscles in your torso. It's the muscles in the front, the side, and the back. Basically, from the middle of your thigh all the way up to the top of your shoulders to the bottom of your neck. So your powerhouse is is huge and your powerhouse encompasses a whole lot of muscles, and a whole lot of bones. These are the terms we hear about in Pilates. And basically, there is nothing wrong with the language of Pilates that Joseph Pilates used as long as you know what the definitions are and you can explain them to your clients. So there's no need to use the word core really, when powerhouse does the job and powerhouse is specific to Pilates. There's no real need to use the phrase neutral spine when you can use the phrase long lifted spine, not bent forward or backward. Again, look at the phrasing. It is much easier to get the image of a long lifted spine and an open breastbone and easy breathing than it is to think of what the hell is neutral spine. So if you're listening to this and you're not really sure about the language and what the language of Pilates is and how to use it effectively for your clients, There are several resources for this online, Um, and I am going to put links to those resources, of course, in the show notes for the episode so that you can easily get to them. But if you're interested in working with me, and I do work a lot with Pilates teachers at all stages of their careers from any background on getting solid on what Pilates is and isn't, getting solid on what the exercises in Pilates are actually called. And this will help you teaching because you'll start to see similar exercises and similar movements on all of the apparatus and mat. If you need work on what beginner is, what intermediate is, what advanced is, what it looks like as you start to layer these exercises in for your clients, what it looks like to modify or vary exercises for clients who need help or for clients who need a little more. 
I offer all of this in my Pilates Teacher Mastermind VIP program. And I would love to see you there. Okay, you could just go over to PilatesTeacherMastermind.com or follow the link in the show notes and take a look. We launch and start on March 1st, which is this coming Wednesday, as I'm recording this on Sunday. And I would really love to see you there. If you are a Pilates client and you would like a little more consistency and to hear that language and do Pilates more in the vein that I'm talking about, I'm happy to work with you and teach you online. Again, just go over to lindalippin.com, click on the work with me button and register yourself for a private session or a class. And if you're not sure what you want to do or how you want to work with me, you know, book a free 20 minute Zoom consultation or phone consultation and we'll figure it out together. So guys, once again, thank you so, so much for listening to the Pilates Goddess podcast. Thank you so much for the support, for the positive feedback. And once again, as always, if you are loving the podcast, please go over to Spotify or the Apple Podcasts app and leave a rating and on Apple, a written review. I will talk to you guys soon. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Pilates Goddess podcast. Music brought to you by Nerd Salad. Please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, especially if you liked it. And please like, share, and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks. Thanks.